Hi, uh, thank you most sincerely for allowing me to uh, address you today on the importance of social entrepreneurship, uh, specifically in the context of the alleviation of suffering of the people St. Teresa of Calcutta referred to as the poorest of the poor. Now, straight away, I want to tell you, I'm not an expert on social entrepreneurs. These extraordinary people uh, who use their entrepreneurial skill, uh, not for their own benefit, but for the benefit of those um, uh, much less fortunate than themselves. However, midway through my career as a sports journalist, way back in 1977, I decided to uh, start an international humanitarian agency. And for the next 35 years, my colleagues, several hundred of them, doctors, nurses, engineers, logisticians, journalists, lawyers, all sorts, uh, we responded to every major international tragedy which happened on the globe. And I think we responded with a measure of success. But even though I was delighted that uh, my fellow uh, 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 friends were able to alleviate the suffering of some of the people, I, I felt that the aid effort in general, the aid community uh, were not solving the problem. I'm talking here about all of the aid agencies from around the world, uh, the missionaries, fantastic human beings, uh, members of the UN and the EU. All of these people did everything humanly possible uh, to alleviate the suffering of these wretched people. But sadly, millions of people died. And the reason was, it wasn't through lack of effort on these people's part, it was because the scale of the problem was such. It was gargantuan. Let me give you an example. I remember visiting Ethiopia in, I think it was November of 1983. And this close friend of mine, a nun, said to me that in her view, and she had been there in Ethiopia about 30 years, somewhere in the region of 15 million people were in danger of losing their lives from starvation. Now, what in heaven's name could a few hundred aid people do to correct that situation and help? We were in a country where there were two civil wars happening, where the government of that country didn't want aid agencies uh, to be involved. So it was a struggle to even reach a few hundred people. So I wondered, you know, there must be some, somebody else, some agency, some utility, something on the planet that we could get to and convince that we were not fit for purpose despite our, our best efforts. And I decided that social entrepreneurs were those people. I felt that their uh, record was such that yes, they were the ones that could convince government of, to honor their responsibilities to the poorest people on the globe. Now, I remember reading one time that Thomas Edison said that if we only knew the extraordinary potential, the prodigious potential we have to do good for others, we'd astound ourselves. I think he's absolutely true. And I think in social entrepreneurs, you have a group that have potential in spades. I also think that you, students, you also have great potential. And that's really why I have spent the last seven years of my life visiting schools and universities, trying to get the message across that the world needs an entity that can go to a tragedy such as a, a genocide or a famine or a hurricane or just abject poverty and do something meaningful to help these people. When I think back of the million people plus who died in the genocide of Cambodia, I was one of the first people in there during Pol Pot's time, the same in Darfur and the Sudan, another million plus. Then in whole uh, various parts of Africa, millions of people were in desperate need of food. And while the aid community did their best, the international community was largely a bystander and was silent. 
So it's patently obvious to all of us that have gone through those catastrophes that if the international community takes the poor of the forgotten world, you know it as the developing world, if they take it seriously and bring their various uh, methods of alleviating suffering to bear on the situation, we have a chance of solving the problem. Now, the term social entrepreneur, it's a relatively new one, but humanitarian heroes have been with us for generations. One thinks of Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King. What contributions they made to the betterment of humanity. And then later on, you had Jimmy Carter, who even in his 90s was still trying to convince students in American universities to go into the forgotten world, look into the eyes of starving children and come up with an idea. My friends, it's all about an idea. How can we get the governments of the world to truly care? That's what drove people like Jimmy Carter, uh, plus people like Bill Gates, who spent maybe half, half his life trying to rid the world of AIDS. And he has convinced hundreds of wealthy people to invest in programs in the forgotten world. And millions are alive because of Bill Gates and his friends. You had Lady Di showing phenomenal courage. You had Mohammed Zunas in Bangladesh coming up with an idea that would allow poor families to borrow money. It was an unheard of thing in the forgotten world. And they could set up their little businesses and repay, which they did the borrowed money. These are people who truly cared and wanted to lift these people out of abject poverty. Happily, the Irish were also to the fore. Think of that incredible man, Chuck Feeney, who gave his entire fortune, eight billion pounds, euros today, to various causes. Bono, Mary Robinson, Bob Geldof, those great entrepreneurs, Dennis O'Brien, Jerry Kennelly, Michael Carey, who went into the forgotten world, looked into the eyes of the starving and said, we have to do something. So the world is awash. There's been an explosion of social entrepreneurs. But what gives me phenomenal hope, and especially when I'm talking to you, is the number of young people that have said, we're not going to wait for government. We will try and find a way of convincing the international community to become centrally involved. You look at Malala, 16 years of age. She tackles the Taliban, the Taliban in Pakistan over the fact that they were depriving girls in a part of that country of the oxygen of education. She went public, she got a bullet in the head for her advocacy, but she survived. And some time later, she became the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Incredible, incredible for a girl of 16. But another teenager, young Donald Woods from Tralee, told he had two months to live when he was coming up to his 17th birthday. What did he do? He spent every second getting his message out about the evils of suicide. He said, no matter how depressed you are, lads and lassies, don't do that. Right up to the moment he took his last breath, that was what motivated Donald Walsh. And then perhaps the most distinguished of all, Greta Thunberg, again 16. And she has done what nobody on the planet could do, convince a government to take the matter of climate change seriously. A government she has managed to convince 148 governments to sign up to an agreement that will mitigate the impact of climate change. That is truly astonishing. And only recently, a footballer, Marcus Ratchford, Manchester United, I'm sure you know more about him than I do. I'm not a United fan, not anymore anyway. He was annoyed, disappointed that the British government had decided to end a feeding program for deserving children in schools. He went public 
He used the power of social media, etc., and he advocated. The most important thing any of us, my friends, can do. And overnight, Mr. Johnson and his friends changed their mind. So the performance and success of Greta Thunberg and Marcus, John, uh, Marcus Ratchford, especially, should have convinced all of us that there is a way. And it's advocacy. And because of the fact that we are, it's, it's now relatively easy to make contact with anyone on the globe, it offers a hope for the poorest people on the planet. Now, if you think of what you can achieve without ever leaving your desk, quite recently, as you probably know, Ireland was allowed to have a seat at the top table the Security Council of the United Nations. So we're now in a very privileged position. Imagine if somebody here in Ireland was able to persuade the Irish government that there are certain things in the forgotten world that need to be changed, need to be improved. For, for example, the world, the poor world doesn't have a champion. There isn't any government on the planet that stands up for the poorest of the poor. And we found that in every disaster that we visited over the last 35 years. Imagine the, the excitement in Ireland to say nothing of what it would do to the people in the forgotten world. If Ireland became the nation, it isn't about money, it's about showing the poorest of the poor, poor that we care, we're thinking of them. The world doesn't have an entity fit for purpose when a famine strikes, when a genocide strikes, when a, a, a tsunami. Imagine if we were able to convince governments that they should contribute quality people to a force just like a fire brigade. They would respond as soon as the need is identified. How sad it is to see thousands of migrants in the Mediterranean pleading with any nation, please, please, they remind me of the mother of Jesus, what she had to do on Christmas Eve. All they're looking for is a safe haven. So imagine if we were able to convince the international community that every country on the globe should take in their, a certain quota of refugees, of migrants, how, how that would benefit so many people. Think of the number of children in the forgotten world that are deprived of education, that spend their lives as child prostitutes, child uh, slaves, child soldiers. That's, that's not what anyone wants to see, but that's happening today. Look at Syria today, look at Yemen, Millions of people starving. So I often think back, my friends, to that moment in 83 when that nun told me about the millions that were starving. And I thought at the time to myself, oh, well, once I get back to Ireland and tell the people in Ireland and then it will go, people around the world will hear, this thing will be solved. We didn't, as a world, take a single starving child out of Ethiopia, the way you would rescue a child from a fire. And I remember shortly after I came back from that first visit, I was, I was pretty depressed to say the least. But I remember going out to a school in Skerries, North County Dublin, and surprisingly, I was speaking to very young children because I was going to show them pictures of children like themselves, but these children, were in the last few hours of their lives because it had affected me so much that I was desperate to try and get my message over to anyone that was prepared to watch the photographs or listen to me. And I'll never forget, this young boy stood up, I, uh, I still think of it, and he said, Mr. O'Shea, my daddy has a boat and uh, he's a fisherman, and he'd go to Utopia. <laughs> he couldn't remember the name Ethiopia, but my God, the love was shining through. 
and he will collect all the hungry babies, all six million who eventually died, imagine, in Ethiopia. So we're talking millions here. And he'll bring the kiddies back to Skerries. And then in Skerries, we'll fatten them up. And when they're all fattened up, we'll bring them back to Utopia and we'll all live happily ever after. That taught me a lot as well of the love that exudes from children uh, and the fact that if they hear about a, a tragedy, the love in them forces them, if you like, encourages them uh, to respond. So my friends, the opportunities for you with your computer in front of you are limitless. You can contact every leader, every government, every person of importance on the globe. You can list the problems that are faced on a daily basis uh, by the poorest of the poor. You can point out that the world's governments have not listened to the pitiful cries of the starving children and ask them, are they happy as leaders? Are they content to let these people suffer and die in a world that has twice the amount of food that we need to feed everybody? My friends, this is not rocket science. <laughs> we, we don't need the type of brain power that one, I suspect, requires if you want to go to the moon or some of the planets. This is about moving food and other resources from one part of the world to another. Not the world is capable of doing this, but sadly, it doesn't have the will to do it. Now, I remember, I'll never forget, uh, uh, the first time I, I went to the forgotten world, and that was to Calcutta in 1977. And on my second day there, I visited a dump where there was over a million people, I was told. And I spoke to young children who told me that they'd never been outside the dump. They were born in the dump and they lived in the dump collecting rubbish and selling it on to try and get enough to sustain them. I just found it very hard. I'd come from the comfort of Ireland. Oh, and we can say what we like, but my goodness, we are so privileged to be here. And we have a moral obligation to help our fellow human being. And I know you want to do that. And I'm sure you're saying to yourself, oh, that's all right well, for adults to do this, that, and the other. I'm saying to you that you have the power and the potential at your fingertips to make a meaningful difference. Now, that's, that's as much as we can hope to do. The scale of the problem, as I said earlier, is gargantuan. But if we can save another human being's life, as Mother Teresa and Nelson, Bell, Nelson Mandela, two people I was very privileged to meet, told me, it was interesting when I asked both of them what I should do. And that each said that if you can change the situation whereby one person in desperate need can live, you've done something extraordinary. They went on to point out that that could inspire other people. You, my friends, are in an ideal position to inspire others. And you have to do it. You have to do it. You now know how bad and how tragic the situation is. And I am absolutely confident that you're going to embrace social entrepreneurship in one form or another. I look forward in the months or maybe years ahead meeting you and discussing your idea. And always remember as well what Victor Hugo famously said. He said, there is nothing in the world more powerful than, even more powerful than the most powerful army, than an idea whose time has arrived. My friends, the time of the social entrepreneur is now. Thank you.